teen movies, even if they were slasher films, unless it was a, a serious, high-minded drama, these were always done on the cheap. Uh, well, com- comedies, all- comedies and horror movies are, tend to be like the cheap genres, right? But at the, well, certainly at the beginning of the decade, but there was some freedom in that too, because, because they were low budget, the directors and the writers had a lot more freedom. It's interesting to think that the people who are really making these movies are the baby boomers who came of age themselves in the 60s and 70s, watching movies that were made by the other generations tell them what it was like to be a teen. So finally, we have like some of the most rebellious teen-oriented generation making movies for my generation and your generation. Well, we're the same generation, but making movies for us. Can I just say something about our older brother and sisters? Right, right. Yeah, I totally get that sense too. I mean, that's, I was thinking the same thing. I mean, I think, I feel like a lot of these movies are made by people who grew up in the 70s. And the 70s was a much more free and open era. You know, there were less pressures on kids. I mean, uh, drug use, sex, uh, you know, and even though supposedly economically things are worse, crime was worse, but, uh, but watching these movies in the 80s as a kid in the 80s, it's just, a lot of them it feels like a different universe, doesn't it? Like, well, they bring a real adult sensibility to the way they depict teen living. Because now, but then the, just as a contrast, and right in the middle of the decade are two movies that I think are really worth talking about, not because of their being edgy at all, but because they're just so damn sweet. And there is something about them that just, they're throwback films uh, in some senses. Uh, but they're really worth talking about. And I'll talk about the first one, which is 1985's uh, The Sure Thing. Uh, it's the second film directed by Rob Reiner after this is Spinal Tap. It stars John Cusack and Daphne Zuniga. And the premise is that uh, John Cusack and Daphne Zuniga are freshmen at uh, New England College. Uh, they both have a reason to go to UCLA. Uh, she has a boyfriend who is at the law school, played by Dylan, the character actor. I can't remember his last name. Sorry. Uh, and then his buddy is telling him that there's an undergraduate named, played by Nicolette Sheridan, who's a sure thing, who's up for a romantic tryst. So they uh, basically decide, they agree to go across country together so that they can... Um, find her she can find her loved one spend time with her him and then he can have his sure thing and i can't remember if he's a virgin or not i think he's a virgin in it so i think it's it's the easy sex and a friend of mine actually met the writer of the screenplay and he had been a big fan of screwball comedies in the 30s and 40s and he just wanted to make an updated version of it happened one night and uh <laughs> do you think he accomplished the, that Absolutely. And, and, and John Cusack, this is also, I think, my introduction to John Cusack, at least as a lead, because he does play a very 80s kind of character that you're going to start seeing a lot. I want to just call him the wise ass, but it, it's almost, I'll just go with the wise ass. It's the kid with a really cool t-shirt who always seems to have a really cool one-liner, who's self-referential, who's in on the joke. He isn't He's a kind of a nerd, but he's not a nerd in the old school sense. He is, he's kind of like just a guy who, I'm just going to say like a wise ass or a clown, who, who very much defines an 80s sensibility. 80s were, were not about being very emotional. We're more about being cool and iconic and ironic. He's kind and, of like, would you say he's kind of like a good looking, cool Jack Black? <laughs> uh, yeah, actually. And Jack, absolutely. And he, and he started yeah, with absolutely. Jack Black and High Fidelity, I think. Was, were they both? Yeah, right. Yeah, actually. And, and, and Jack Black is around my age. So, yeah, there's, and so is John Cusack. Actually, John Cusack and Jack Black, I believe, are the same, are not that far apart in age. They may be like two years apart in age. So, uh, it's just that they, that uh, it's just one broke earlier than the other, to be honest. With you. <laughs> because, uh, and, 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 that, and, and John Cusack is a more, traditionally handsome guy versus Jack Black. But even in the 80s, a traditionally handsome guy was still playing a nerdy type. Uh, I met John, John Cusack in real life. The guy's 6'2". He's built like a freaking linebacker. Oh, I didn't know that. But he was able to project a certain kind of lanky goofiness. Really, the goofy clown 
is really what I'm saying. He's a goofy clown guy. He's going to become very much a part of an 80s style comedy. I will fall in love with that style. I am in college when I see this, but I'm a freshman in college. So again, I totally key into it. Uh, at this point, I also have a fantasy about L.A. I liked Daphne Zuniga. I thought she did a great job. Uh, she's smart. She's funny. She matches Cusack. Well, I think she's actually one of the best people ever to be cast against uh, John Cusack. I also think, unlike all the other films I've mentioned, which are really more about the point of view, uh, well, Valley Girl, Valley Girl's also pretty, no, I honestly think more than any of the films that we've mentioned up to this point, there's a really good pairing of two different actors and two different characters who are really having chemistry and holding their own. I, I think Deborah Foreman and Nick Cage do a great job, but Nick Cage is such a cool dude, and he's such a grown-up teen, and Deborah Foreman is such a popular girl that these are the kids who I would almost dream about more than identify with, whereas I f could completely identify with the John Cusack character, and I could very much identify the kind of girl that, that the Daphne Zuniga was playing. Uh, though, technically, the sure thing, the Nicolette Sheridan character, she is the fantasy. Uh, and again, it is very much a good coming-of-age film. Uh, the film that you saw the next year uh, is Lucas from 1986. you want to talk about that for a bit? Well, Lucas is uh, another one of these movies about the nerd, you know, who... Uh, who uh and he's a nerd the 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 protagonist in the movie the nerd character is uh he's way too smart for a kid but <laughs> it's like a way too film, precocious right? uh it's kind of sweet but i there are some scenes that are really what, strange what's the story I mean, about i've never seen it tell me what it's about i think it's about a nerdy kid who joins a football team to prove something <laughs> and uh you know he gets the girl and I mean, it's, it's, <sighs> he's an awkward kid though, right? Yeah, but he's super brainy and he, and he, and he, uh, he's super brainy and he uses his brains and his quick wit to, uh, to, uh, put the bullies in their place. I mean, it's, it's like a total, like, uh, uh, nerd fantasy movie. I mean, <sighs> it's hard, you know. Okay. So it's, it's more like you, what you wish than what it was. I know Carrie Green was in it as well. She plays the girl, uh, so there's romance in it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind I of a pain. I, I, I feel like, because I didn't see it till a little bit later, but I feel like I remember friends of mine liked it a lot at the time, but it's kind of a painful movie to watch. I mean, How so? I remember. just because there's all these scenes where the nerd, you know, uh, gets his revenge, you know, his comeuppance, and they're just completely ridiculous. You know, they're unbelievable. You know, there's no way that could happen. But I, it just seemed like everyone says it's a sweet film. I remember when it came out, all these girls like, oh, you should say it's a sweet film. I remember meeting Carrie Green. She went to college with my sister. And I'm like, damn, I really should have seen that movie so I could <laughs> say, hey, there, you were really good in Lucas. There instead, are, I'm like, I don't know. I heard good things. There are romantic scenes between the nerd boy and the girl that uh, are kind of sweet, but... I think they even talk about evolutionary psychology in some of the scenes, which is all right, but um, I don't know. It just, it's, it's, it's very awkward. It's a very awkward movie. Like the whole movie is just strange and awkward. And, and I think strange and awkward. I mean, let's, let's build on this because I think the mid nineties is really where I think you get right in the middle of that decade in, in, in the eighties teen comedy, the nerd, really starts to hit pretty damn hard with what you're talking about. Well, let's talk about, about this and next movie, Revenge of the Nerds, right? Right. Yeah. So let's let's talk about... Because that these, is the real... next four films, I, I just want to say. Yeah, Revenge of the Nerds. Go on. Yeah, that's the quintessential, like, uh, nerds get their revenge movie. I mean, it's called Revenge of the Nerds. And yeah, it I've, really... I've, I've never seen it, but man, that movie, when it came out, it was so freaking popular. It's a great it movie. It was so popular. And I right. deliberately did not see it because it's a great I did movie. I want to identify with nerds. <laughs> it's a great movie. It's funny, entertaining, and like I was saying before, I don't know if kids today even have a nerd concept what, anymore. I mean, they is, all have all, all kids about? have a all kids have a computer in their pocket. Yeah, They're all nerds yeah. now. I don't know. No, sir, you, guys, you don't know. It's a good point. I mean, everybody's a nerd a, now. To nerds be a were nerd, just the cutting cultural nerd, cutting edge. 
to be a nerd in the 80s was not a good call, even though computers were starting to become a big way of establishing yourself, they were entering our lives, the kids who were good at computers definitely had the edge, and there was a lot of nerd culture, there was all the Star Treks and Star Wars and Dungeons and Dragons. I remember, listen, listen. yeah, Dungeons and Dragons, I remember, okay, in the 80s, not everybody had a computer, I remember telling a girl in my high school, and she was... The valley, she ended up being the valley torrent of our high school, the smartest girl in the, in the school probably. And I asked her if she liked playing video games. Yeah. She never played and, but, video games. But, never but, played you know, video games. That's but a really good day plays video point. games on their phone. Like, like, by, mid, the, by the mid 80s, the nerd, because you're right. I think this is a very good stop. But it's a good midpoint, which is that, um, you know, as the 80s is progressing from the beginning to the middle, a lot of nerdy things are becoming more common more popular i know that i started playing dungeons and dragons in the early 80s video games became better cheaper more accessible arcade games became more accessible cheaper better uh computers uh i got a computer i didn't get a computer in 84 but i started using my college's computer in 84 and i certainly had friends who had computers in 84 and definitely by 85 everyone i knew was writing their papers on a computer. No one was, almost no one was using a typewriter. So, yeah, there was a lot of things to nerd out on. Uh, there were a lot of fantasy books and sword and sorcery. Uh, there were all sorts of games, Star Trek, old Star Trek, Star Wars. There was a lot of nerd culture, and it was definitely, I, it was I, definitely I, more out in the open by the mid '80s. Well, you know, I look around today and every, almost everybody, all the young kids today, almost all of them, I feel like are nerds now. I mean, they're all on Twitter talking about, uh, you know, uh, philosophy, you know, as it pertains to race, especially in class now. Um, but, you know, on message boards, <laughs> computer message boards, internet message boards are all on the internet. I mean, everybody has email, you know, everybody has Facebook, whatever. I mean, it's, 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 it, it, everybody's very nerdy now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say that, but in the 80s, you could be a lot more nerdy than you could be in the 70s and by the middle of the decade because so many things like technology were starting to become cool. Uh, the things I just mentioned, video games were becoming cool. Uh, knowing how to use your computer became cool. Also, the new wave movement, the new wave movement, which was very popular, especially in high school, was a very nerdy look. You know, Elvis Costello with his glasses, uh, you know, the bright colors, the geometric patterns, the short hair. Uh, it was as cool, uh, it was, I mean, even if, I think nerds never looked any cooler or had as many cool nerd avatars as they did in the 80s. And certainly when you see the kind of characters that are, we're about to cover, but we'll start with even like John Cusack, which is the cool nerd. Uh, the nerd was become, and, and maybe that's because the people who write screenplays and make movies were nerds themselves in the 70s in high school, and they're just writing, in some sense, their own revenge fantasy. So Revenge of the Nerds, does that take place in high school or college? It takes place in college, uh, yes. So that's, you know, another uh, another good nerd movie. Is it like that, an Animal House kind of thing where they're the. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like the nerd version of Animal House. I mean, uh, like that. You know, those two movies, Revenge of the Nerds and Animal House, they're they're interesting to contrast because they're both about uh, fraternity houses, right? That are fighting right. against the establishment. But right. uh, and you know, the Animal House uh, fraternity is not that mainstream either. I mean, that you know. The, the Animal House fraternity is almost, almost the '70s nerds, you know, almost. Right. I mean, there's really not much of a nerdy construct in the '70s, you know. The, the well, I mean, in Animal House, or Flounder, played by Stephen Dorff, and the other character who joins, I can't remember his name, but played by the guy who did Amadeus, they're the nerdy boys who join Delta House, and in the process of, of joining the fraternity, they become cool frat boys, which actually around this period of time is actually when I'm in college. And that was a very popular movie with 18 year olds and teenagers 
from the, but again, it came from the 70s. So that was our point of reference, whereas Revenge of the Nerds really was the, one of the college movies made for, quote unquote, my generation. So, and let me just say one more thing about Revenge of the Nerds. Revenge of the yeah. Nerds is interesting in that they're, they, <laughs> Revenge of the Nerds is one of the more interesting movie about, quote unquote, nerds because the nerd construct, because they try to incorporate all these different types of nerds. You know, there's a gay black nerd there's a nerd oh, that wow. likes, there's nerds that like music, there's nerds that like math, there's nerds, that, they're, they're, they're nerds in all sorts of different subjects, right, that are all into different things. This one nerd, he ends up liking sex. He's, a, he's just like a sex nerd, which is an actual nerd. <laughs> and, so do, you know, they, he's good, and that's where they get the sex into the movie. Do they ever, uh, do they ever do anything with science in that movie? Uh, God, it's been a long time since I've seen it, but I'm pretty sure yes. Pretty so, sure. because I want to pick the next, because this, this movie falls into another mid-80s subcategory and i do honestly think it's because at this point personal computers are entering the market and being good at computers is actually a way you can achieve status in high school and college so around that same time you have a movie called weird science which comes out in 1985 uh about these two geeky high school students who build the perfect woman well they're you nerds they're, they're nerds. nerds and you know what and, it, weird science is kind of like uh, a takeoff on frankenstein except instead of making frankenstein these two kids make uh the most attractive woman possible we're <laughs> using their computer fair, but you know what it's a, it, i know it sounds really sleazy and cheap but and it it's is because it, no it's not because uh kelly lebrock does a great job as that woman but kelly lebrock i can't remember the, name of the actress now who plays her but she she teaches them a lesson about life so it, she, it, it, she is such a good actress in this movie. Like, like yeah. she makes this movie. Like if it wasn't for her, this movie probably would have been it, just another well, crazy Coleman, ass who, B movie. Who plays the older military brother is brilliant in it as well. He's it great. stars Anthony Michael Hall, who is, it's actually very interesting because he's, he's going to make a career playing nerdy kids throughout this decade. I can't remember the other kid. That's another but, interesting thing, the older brother. So that's the interesting thing about it because the older brother character is an attempt, I think, to create a character that's the opposite of the nerd. Yeah, and he's, he's they do a, a great job. job. They do a great yeah. job. And, you know, you watch that character today, and uh, it's hard to even imagine he exists anywhere. I mean, maybe yeah. he does, but... <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's definitely a fantasy film. There's very little reality in it. Well, nerds have uh, taken I, over, is my point. But nerds have taken over. Another film I just want to go right into, same year, back into college, uh, only slightly more grounded, but not by much. And that is Real Genius, also directed by Martha Coolidge, who uh, did uh, Valley Girl. And it is about this young genius kid who goes to college, uh, has no friends, befriends the wild upperclassman played by Val Kilmer. It is an amazing role. Val Kilmer is definitely playing almost uh, a combination of a Jeff Spicoli type and the kind of character that uh, John Cusack is playing. So he's a, he's a little bit of a 70s stoner. He's a bit of an 80s wild man. He's very cool. They find out uh, that they're working on a military government project to make a death ray. The film is, the politics are very much to the left. I can't remember the name of the character actor who plays the principal, but he was a guy who did a Die Hard movie. He's just a very great character actor who plays the villain. Uh, very funny. Uh, the kid who plays a teenager is a teenager i know someone who went to high school with him at the time that he was making the movie uh it's very zany and very silly uh there is some romance in it you know it, it, it's it's a great nerd fantasy movie there's a yeah. lot there's some there's some dark parts to it though which makes it oh. interesting they're 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 interesting i mean uh yeah it's not totally oh. fancy it's 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 well, fascinating dark, it's a fascinating dark, movie i think the dark parts are are, are really actually the political parts well, it's also about, I guess I'll ruin it for everybody. There's a character in the movie that uh, uh, he gets, he's a nerd that gets burnout. You know, he pushes himself too hard. And that's a very interesting character in the movie. I um, forgot all about that. To be but honest. it's the dark, it's like, it's like the dark side of uh, being a genius. But even you know? if that's the case, it's, it's a very small moment in a very big film. And we're not giving anything away. It's though. a fun movie. It's a fun it's movie. A fun it's very movie. inventive. I, you know, I'd always wished that, uh, I don't know. They made a sequel or TV show. I mean, maybe they yeah. did make a TV show. But I don't know. Terrible. I mean, a I don't movie that now. is not going to be on this list because it's not a comedy. But if it was, I would have put it right here. It would have been also from that period of like mid 80s, which is War Games. 
which again is a match. It's right in here. Ali it's right Shimini in here. And, and she, you know, he plays a genius kid who hacks into NORAD. And Can I just say about war games is the, it's not science fiction. Everything just, well, there are science fiction. Everything elements, about but, it is real. But yeah. a lot of the tech in war games at the time, it was very realistic. Okay. So the way he does the war driving in the beginning and he finds the, uh, the computer and I mean, the, the, the whole the computer being so sophisticated is is the ridiculous part. It's it's like no computer had that kind of AI at the time, but or now even. Yeah. But, uh, but the way he finds it and he hacks into the computer, it was all very of that era, you know. If you oh, it's based on a real event. It's actually based on something that actually happened, right. uh, on a minor level, but it's it's based on real history. If, but yeah, right. I mean that is, uh, you know, every that's why War Games that, is a great movie. War Games is every a great element that we talk about that's a comedy, absolutely works in this 1983 John Badham film with Ali Sheedy and uh, Matthew Broderick and Dabney Coleman and John Wood. It's a great film. I'm going to just pretend for a second that it belongs in here, uh, even though it doesn't. But I think the culmination of the high concept science fiction uh, and even weirdly enough nerd uh, movie, the one that is, I think, the most successful uh, of this period, and for many people, it's probably even the best teen movie of this era, uh, is Back to the Future uh, by Robert Zemeckis, 1985, executive produced by Steven Spielberg. Uh, it stars Michael J. Fox, who at the time was on probably one of the most popular teen TV comedies of the time, uh, Family Ties, playing the titular character, uh, Michael J. Ke uh, uh I can't remember the name of the character. Yeah, Michael Keaton. I can't remember. His Michael J. Fox? This Alex Keaton, thank you. Who was this Alex 80s? Alex P. Keaton. Alex P. Keaton, 80s yuppie Reaganite teen who was rebelling against his hippie parents. But in this movie, uh, you all know it. There's, I don't even need to tell you the plot of Back to the Future. <laughs> and you're saying, wait a second, Chris, I thought you guys weren't talking about movies that take place in the past. You're only talking about movies that take place in the present. Like, no, I'm only, we're only talking about films where it's an 80s teenager. So Marty McFly is an 80s teenager, albeit transferred to the world, the teen world of his parents. You know, I'll, uh, say, I'll, say, the talk interesting, about it. I'll say the interesting thing about Back to the Future. Okay, so Marty McFly is kind of a nerd in the modern day. He goes back in time and he finds out his dad is like a super nerd. <laughs> his dad is a classic nerd. He's and a classic nerd. He's a, he's a modern Marty McFly is a modern nerd. He goes is, back in time Marty, and he finds out his dad Marty, is a classic nerd from the fifties, which is when nerddom is, probably started. Is Marty even a nerd? I would argue. I, that, I, I mean, I, I has, wonder that. I, I mean, wonder that myself. He has a girlfriend. He wears cool clothes. He can play guitar, and he's hot headed, and he likes to fight. It's almost so like I, Marty. It's almost like Marty is not a nerd, and he goes back in time and he finds out. And to he his finds his out his dad, dad is a nerd. Dad is a nerd. I think Marty is not. I don't think Marty is as mean as Biff, but I, I think Marty is definitely not. I think Marty is, Marty McFly might be the most average kid you've ever seen in a teen movie of the 80s because he's definitely not a nerd and he has a girlfriend and he knows how to skateboard, which makes him a cool kid in yeah, 1985. Maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. I mean, it's hard for me to read. Doc Brown is the nerd. It's, it's, it but, is weird that he is friends with a mad scientist. Well, that, the fact that I his mean, only friend is a John Mulaney did a great bit on this. It's very funny about how they pitch back to the future. I think I've heard it. Like, you know, he's only one friend. It's a middle-aged mad scientist. He's a nuclear engineer. He has no other friends. He goes back in time, and he almost has sex with his mother. Uh, so, well, uh, it, yeah, it, which is also very... Well, like good. I said, this is another... This is, a you know... This movie, Back to the Future, fits into the whole exploration of the nerd again. And, you know, it's funny how all these movies came out in the mid-'80s. Uh, uh, so Doc Brown's a super nerd, okay? Yeah. I mean, Doc Brown is, like, so incredibly nerdy. They got the, they, they, Zemeckis got the nerdiest actor he could possibly find to, to nerd it up as much as possible. And then Marty goes back in time and finds out his dad was a super nerd. And he didn't even – I don't think he even realized his character. Well, if you really, his if you dad really, is such a super nerd. If you really think about it, the whole concept of the movie is that Marty is such, I hate to say it, Marty is such a cool 80s kid. Not cool, but he's, he's, he's as cool as any average 80s kid would be, so, which doesn't make him cool, but he has to help his nerd dad 
learn how to be a man and be be cool Biff. and get his mom right and but yeah be cool be, now mind you Biff almost rapes his mom this is very serious crap this is not like light-hearted comedy so he's basically asked to teach his dad it's a very weird movie he well, you got to learn to fight. He teaches his dad how to yeah, fight. To because... fight and to be a man and, 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 and be assertive. It's not a negative thing, I'm just saying, but it, it's a kind of a neat fantasy. It is a fantasy because not the part about your mom. That's kind of, I've never been comfortable with that. But it is an interesting fantasy to, to be, you know, the roles are reversed. As opposed to your dad teaching you how to be a man, you're teaching your dad how to be a man. And um, I realized a movie that could have been on this same list and I completely forgot, would have been Peggy Sue Got Married. But in Peggy Sue Got Married, she's a grown-up who goes back to the 60s, to the life of a teenager. And therefore, it's not entirely really a teen comedy let about me, what it's like to be a teen in the 80s, which is okay. why it's not on this list. Let me ask you something, Chris. We're only about like halfway through, but... We're almost done, actually, folks. Okay, okay. But it so strikes me, like, I knew we were going to talk about this, but it strikes me so much how how all these movies are about the nerd construct and i don't i almost don't understand why it's such well a because the nerd construct of is this era. Uh, well in comedy an outsider is always the protagonist often the protagonist of a comedy is an outsider and comedy is often about taking on the establishment and in the 60s and 70s i think the anti-establishment kid was the bad kid you know the outsider the poor kid the kid who was antisocial, the kid who was into rock and roll. Whereas a lot of the nerdy people who, who got into filmmaking wanted to tell their story about what it was like to be the awkward kid, the awkward girl, the awkward boy. It's really nice. I mean, there's a lot of really strong directors in this who are female. There are a lot of strong actresses who are females. I don't think of this as a single sex genre, though the nerd part that we're covering right now has hit pretty hard on dudes so only one last thing i want to say about back to the future that's very important historically is it's the most expensive movie made at that time about teens it's the most profitable teen movie made at that time and it absolutely changes it's one of the two i'd argue it's one of the two game-changing teen comedies of the decade because from that point moving forward every studio is just cranking out teen movies and going into high concept. 